started. We'll just hum music for today. Welcome everybody. We're excited to have you in class today. My name is Kari Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center and I'm excited for this AP court case review. We're going to walk through the 15 top cases that are in the AP government exam. If you're taking the exam, we send you positive vibes and remember, breathe and get a lot of oxygen in. You can do it. If you're not and you're just here for exposure of the cases, it's going to be a fun class. And I'm here with two awesome experts. Tom Donnelly, our, one of our constitutional fellows, our top scholar at the National Constitution Center. Tom, I want to say hi to everybody. Hello. And I'm also here with David Olson. David Olson is an amazing teacher out of Madison, Wisconsin, and he has taught AP for how many years? Uh, quite a long time. Um, <laughs> a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. He long is going to be your expert guide on how to answer these questions to really help you be successful in the test. So I'm here to ask questions. Tom here's for content. Dave's here for connecting the dots to the exam. Ask all the questions you want. We'll help you out in the Q&A and the chat. So let's get started. Now, these are in six different group groupings, Tom. And the first grouping is about court cases that have to do with federalism. So the two court cases that they put in this section um, are McCullough and United States v. Lopez. And when I think about these court cases and the idea of federalism, what I'd love for you to kind of help the students understand is first, let's make sure we all understand what federalism is. Second, how do these court cases act as bookends to the power of federalism and how it works? And then how do we understand federalism in the idea of between the branches and between the federal government, the state government and the individuals. So a lot to do. You don't have a lot of time, but have fun with it. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Curry. Yeah, so let's begin with federalism itself. I mean, when we speak of federalism, what we're really talking about is the great debate over which powers go to the national government, which powers go to the states. When we created a, and ratified a new constitution, we created a national government with more powers than it had before that, but at the same time, it was a government of limited powers. And we continued to say that states were gonna play a central role in shaping important policy decisions. And so what we see in these two cases, one during the Marshall Court, McCullough v. Maryland, and one towards the end of the 20th century in the Rehnquist Court, United States versus Lopez, are sort of bookends in this debate with McCullough giving us Chief Justice Marshall's pretty broad reading of the powers of Congress. And then the Rehnquist Court in Lopez saying, no, 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 no. We are still a national government of limited powers. So let's dig into McCullough and see what's going on there. And so the conflict we see here between McCullough is a conflict between the national government and the state of Maryland. And so what's happening here, it's a constitutional debate that's one of the biggest ones in early America. It's over whether Congress has the power to charter a national bank. And so this particular case arises uh, in 1819 is when it's decided. Uh, but in 1816, Maryland has decided, one, Congress doesn't have the power to, to uh, charter a national bank. And two, we are going to use our state powers as Maryland to tax the national bank out of existence. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to impose taxes on this national institution to try to destroy it. This case actually ends up then in the courts. It ends up before the Supreme Court in McCullough v. Maryland. And Maryland's argument is very simple. It says, Congress, show me in the Constitution where the Charter Bank Clause is. There is no clause like that. Therefore, you do not have the power to charter a national bank. The national bank chartered by Congress is unconstitutional. This is what Maryland's arguing. And Chief Justice Marshall and the Supreme Court say, no, Maryland, you're wrong. You are reading the Constitution incorrectly. There are two big things that uh, Chief Justice Marshall says here in McCullough. One is, how do we know this? One, look at the necessary and proper clause of the Constitution in Article I. It tells us that there is some flexibility. Congress has some flexibility to determine which policies it can pass to enact and exercise the powers that are listed in the Constitution. So it doesn't matter that there's no charter bank clause in the Constitution. What Congress is doing here is it's taking an action that is related in a reasonable way to other powers that are listed, like the power to tax and spend for the general welfare. So Maryland, you are reading the Constitution too uh, stingily. Congress has more flexibility than that. And then two, you are also uh, ignoring the supremacy clause of the Constitution, which says when the national government is acting legitimately, 
that the national government and national law is supreme over the states. And so with that, what Marshall famously says is, Maryland, you're attempting to tax this national institution out of existence. The power to tax is the power to destroy. That tax is unconstitutional. And as a result, McCullough there, we get a pretty broad reading of the powers of Congress. Great. So it opens up the door for a broad reading of what the powers of Congress are and this supremacy of the federal law over the state law. Now we kind of swing to the other side of that and also the future. Many, many years later, United States v. Lopez. How are these two cases connected? Um, I know you want to dive into what the case says first, but then goes connect those dots of why did they pick these two cases to put together to understand federalism? Absolutely. So Lopez, the facts are pretty simple. It's a student coming, going into their high school with a concealed weapon. This student is then prosecuted under the national law known as the Gun-Free Schools Act of 1990, which banned guns in schools. And then what the student says is that you are prosecuting me under this law passed by Congress. That law is unconstitutional. It exceeds the powers of Congress. And, you know, why is this important? Why is this case important? Well, in many ways, Lopez becomes an opportunity for the Supreme Court to return to fundamentals, to return to the foundation of Congress's power to a certain extent. And what the Supreme Court says here in Lopez broadly is Congress is still a, a, an institution of limited powers. There are limits on Congress's power. We know that the Marshall Court and McCullough said the powers are broad. We know the Supreme Court for decades has really allowed Congress to do a lot of things, especially to regulate the economy. The Supreme Court has read congressional power broadly from 1937 to Lopez. It doesn't restrict congressional power under the Commerce Clause at all. And so in Lopez in 1995, though, the court says, no, there are limits here. They say, Mr. Lopez, you are right. The Gun-Free Schools Act is unconstitutional. It exceeds Congress's powers. And why? Well, in part, what we're trying to do is set some sort of limits on the powers of Congress under the commerce power. And what the court says here is that the problem here is that this sort of regulation, it's in the schools, so it's a quintessentially uh, state and local issue. It's usually where states have the most power. This is a non-economic activity. It's carrying a handgun. And that, that activity, in order to be constitutional, has to be, quote unquote, substantially related to interstate commerce. And the court says, no, that connection isn't close enough. The last thing I'll note, Curry, is that's the general rule. It's, it's a limit on the powers of Congress. But practically speaking, since Lopez, the court has really not trimmed back too much on Congress's powers. So it's a, a test that's out there. The court will apply it sometimes, but it hasn't had a ton of bite over time. So real quick, Tom, and don't worry if you don't have the answer. I can always uh, put it in the chat. But with these court cases, McCullough v. Maryland, do you know the split between the um, justices? McCulloch well, Maryland was unanimous, but that's yeah, true of perfect. almost like almost all cases in the in the uh, Marshall Court. But I, I will say, Kerry, politically, it remained there were still debates on both mm. sides. And so it's just the Supreme Court itself was unanimous. And what about uh, United States v. Lopez? Was there a split? Five to four. Five, four. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's go to the court cases around this balance between order and liberty, this idea that, you know, at times, when we think of the, the words of Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that we give away rights to a government to have a government, but that we're in control of that government, and that there are certain unalienable rights that no matter what the government cannot step on, we cannot give away because they are instinctual to us as existence. Very yeah, existential there, but this idea between how do we, how do we make sure that we are having a government that has power to do what it needs to do and that individual rights are protected. And we see that in the Bill of Rights and that's what these court cases all are all about. But sometimes the two come at odds. They kind of have a friction between the two. I don't wanna say that they kind of collide. It's more like they rub past a little bit with each other. So we put a whole bunch of court cases in this section and I'd love for you to walk through each of the court cases and then show the different parts of the constitution that are in tension with the government's role and the individual's role for each one. Sure, so let's begin with Engel versus Vital. This is the famous school prayer case. And the conflict here is between New York, the New York State Board of Regents and the parents of kids in a public school. And so what New York has done here is that it's authorized public schools to recite a short voluntary prayer at the beginning of the, each school day. Here's the text of the prayer. 
Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. So we see a, a, a general prayer. It's non-denominational. But the, stu- but the students here, their parents are arguing that this prayer alone violates the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. So it's the parents asserting a First Amendment right against a state here, the state of New York. And so who wins? The Supreme Court says the parents are right. In a six to one decision, the court strikes down the New York prayer under the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. And basically what it says is, you know, a state like New York, it can't compose prayers and have schools and uh, have, have, have various public schools say them aloud during the school day. Um, And so this is a very controversial decision at the time. There's a big backlash against it, but the court stands by it and it expands it to cover other things in schools like graduations, um, uh, high school football games, things like that. At the same time, what it does say is that if it's a context in which you're dealing with adults, prayers in government settings can be okay. So before a legislative session, a session of Congress, um, a town council meeting, there's, and, and I think that what's doing most of the work here is this, this idea that the court has that when you're dealing with students, when you're dealing with children, there's a concern that the, that the government can really coerce them to believe something that they wouldn't believe otherwise. And we think of adults as hardier in that context. I think if you're trying to look at, 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 at you know, what's animating. Yeah, and thinking about the power that adults in positions of authority have to influence the beliefs of students and in, especially in a case of religion, that's the job of the parents is what the courts would say. So the, the next court case looks at, again, at the role of what's the role of the public school system and what's the role of the parents? Yes, yeah, so this is Wisconsin versus Yoder. The conflict here is between the state of Wisconsin and an Amish family. And so the, the law that's at issue, it's a law, it's a state law requiring all children to attend public schools until age 16. And what the Amish family says is that this requirement conflicts with our faith. It's going to destroy our community. If our, our children, one, they don't require, they're not required in order to succeed in our community to be in school anywhere past eighth grade. I mean, as you get further and further along in school, they're going to be, uh, uh, they're going to be taught more and more worldly influences. And this is going to undermine our faith. Overall, this law is in conflict with our religious precepts. It violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. And the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision says, Amish family, you're right. This is a violation of the free exercise clause. And what we're gonna do is that we are going to exempt you. We're gonna give you an accommodation from this law that applies to everyone. And so we see these sets of cases across a range of contexts where you have a general law applying to everyone, religious challengers coming in and saying that law violates the precepts of our religion. And the court has to sort out, you know, when does the government win? When do the religious challengers win? It's notable that Yoder really is one of the few really big examples of religious dissenters winning in these cases before the Supreme Court. But it remains a topic of really close constitutional debate among scholars, among judges, among justices. And so this is a really important area of law more generally. Okay, so one question, and it's a great question. So why is it going to be um, 6-1? Um, Sorry. <laughs> We can come back to it. I was as just in, looking it as up. As in what happened to the other two justices? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So they're, they're, they're just end up being, uh, uh, I, I think they're, I forget who was not on the court at that time, but there were presumably some vacancies. Um, yeah. And so we were waiting to, I, I don't think anyone abstained, um, but I, 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 I actually don't remember. I will double check it. Sorry, I didn't mean to stump you there, but I was like, oh, I wondered that too. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, so, the justices were getting pretty, uh, some of them were getting old during that time. So they could have been either infirm or it might've just been a vacancy. I forget. Um, good question from the chat. The law is exempt only for Amish students? Well, as, as applied to that case, yes. But this, a similar reasoning could be brought by other religious challengers, presumably. So the principle could sweep more broadly. But it has to be a religious challenge, not just, I don't want my kid to go to school after an eighth grade. Correct. Correct. And it still is the case, as you even see in that case, the state can still come up with compelling reasons to pass a law. And even the Amish are sending their children to public schools for a period of time. They're just having it end in eighth grade. And what the court's saying is, if you state want to pass laws like this, you just need a good reason for it. You may have it, but you need to give it. Awesome. So the next case, um, Tinker versus Des Moines, this is a great case, but I also wanted to let our students know, and I'll send it to you in an email. Um, Mary Beth Tinker is coming to speak with the National Constitution Center on May 1st on an online program. We'll send it out to you all. It's all free. Um, And it's a great way to hear directly from Mary Beth Tinker what it was like to be 
the student protesting and the student in the court case. So really cool experience. And it will be for Law Day, which is May 1st. I'm trying to make that a really loud, <laughs> informed holiday. Okay, Tom, back to you. Sure. So this is the famous uh, Tinker versus Des Moines case. The conflict is between the Tinkers, which are these, uh, these students, um, and the school district. That's the government in this case. It's the public school district. And the, uh, the issue is that these students are wearing those black armbands you say there, see there, to school to protest the Vietnam War. And the school tells them, take off the armbands. This isn't a place for political protest. It's going to disrupt learning. The students refuse. They're punished. And they bring a challenge under the First Amendment's protection of the freedom of speech. And they say, this is core political speech. Um, we, don't, we don't lose our free speech rights when we come to school. The school can't punish us for this. And what the Supreme Court said here in uh, a 72 decision is, students, you're right. This is a First Amendment free speech violation. The famous line is it can hardly be argued that, that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. So students still have free speech rights in schools. The thing to understand is the court and Tinker also says those rights are different than what we have more broadly outside of the school setting. So schools have more authority than other government bodies when the students are in school, they can restrict speech if it's going to quote materially or substantially interfere with the school's operation and mission. The problem here was a factual problem. The court was, uh, the uh, school was predicting there would be disruption, but there was no disruption. So the link between the justification and what's happening on the ground has to be pretty tight. But as we know, Curry, the cases that come after this, the court does recognize a variety of contexts where schools really can step in and restrict speech. And you can look at that with Hazelwood. If you want to look into a really great case to dive into, they're restricting freedom of the press in that one, but it's the idea that it could cause an issue. Now, when we talk about freedom of the press, we're going to go now outside the school because all of these cases are talking about what's inside the school. We're talking about public schools and the First Amendment freedoms are different outside the school. And this is one of my favorite cases. It's so darn interesting. Um, the, the Pentagon Papers is what we all call it, but it's New York Times v. United States. Sure. So the conflict here is between New York, the New York Times and the Washington Post, so newspapers on the one hand, and the Nixon administration. So what are the Pentagon Papers? Well, the Pentagon Papers, they're, they're, they're comprised of a, a secret report that was put together by the national government covering America's operations in Vietnam over the course of two decades. And the report itself included government secrets, including things that the government thought could um, undermine national security, perhaps embarrass the government too. There was information about US involvement in political assassinations, things like that. And so the argument here from the Nixon administration is stop the presses. They're gonna they go to court and they say, stop the presses. You cannot publish this secret report. It has government secrets. If you publish it, it's gonna undermine national security. American troops might die. It's a very stark argument the Nixon administration makes, um, and it ends up before the Supreme Court very quickly. And what the court says is, no, Nixon administration, you are wrong. You are wrong in this situation. What we know is the First Amendment at its core is about that there will be no what's called prior restraints. So prior restraints are when the government goes into court and says, don't publish this material. So trying to keep things from being published, for trying the government trying to stop the presses. And what the court says is that, no, to succeed in a case where you're asking for a prior restraint, you need a really, 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 really good reason. People almost never have those reasons. And simply saying national security is not enough. You need a stronger reason than that. Why is this important? Because the core of free speech is all about speech about issues of public concern, speech that goes to sometimes attempts to check the government, to criticize the government, to say the government's abusing its authority. And the, the court conceived of this case is at the very core of that value. And that's a 6-3 decision? Um, I don't have the, I, that might be, I don't have, I don't think I have the breakdown. No Maybe, worries. I think I'm pretty sure it is. And I'll triple check at the end of this and we'll follow up with the students. Now, when we look at all these cases, we see, you know, the court siding, and it's not always the case, but the court siding on the side of the paper, of the student, of the parents. And then we look at other cases and Schenck versus the United States is in the exam as well. And this is a case where the court doesn't side with the, um, the, the guy in his speech who's handing out pamphlets. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about this case and maybe cases that are connected to it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So it's Shank is in here to emphasize the fact that free speech rights, like all other rights, are not absolute. 
there are limits. And so this case takes place in the context of World War I, the conflict are between people who oppose that war and the national government. The national government passed something called the Espionage Act of 1917. And part of what it makes illegal is speech that has a tendency to undermine arm, the armed forces and obstruct military recruitment. And here the pamphlets were seen and the people were prosecuted for passing out circulars designed to obstruct the military draft for World War I. And so the government prosecutes them under the Espionage Act. They are convicted. And the, the, pro, the, uh, the, dissent, the, um, the, the speakers here argue that, no, 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 the Espionage Act, of course it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of the First Amendment's protection of free speech. It's at the core of free speech. We just talked about it with the Pentagon Papers case. This is political speech about a war. What's more important than that? And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, sides with the government. It upholds the conviction. And it's a decision by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, and this is where he establishes his famous clear and present danger test. And what he says is that when the court's deciding cases like this about free speech, the question it has to ask itself is, were the words used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent? And here's the really, really famous line. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Now, no, it has to be, you have to be speaking falsely in that particular, in that particular scenario. Uh, but nevertheless, what Holmes is expressing is that there are limits on free speech. And I think more broadly, when we look at this case in historical context, it's about certain restrictions on free speech in the middle of a war. Um, and so that's probably doing a lot of the practical work. But the, the big, big picture is there are limits on free speech rights. Awesome. And okay, next, there is one where we moved into this section um, that's uh, Citizens United. It's again, a First Amendment case. And then we're going to fly through the next four sections. <laughs> of course, so Citizens United, the FEC. So this is a, a, a fairly recent case. The conflict is between Citizens United and the national government. The, the Congress has passed something called the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. And what it does is it restricts political spending by corporations and labor unions. And the, it, the, this case itself involves a documentary about criticizing Hillary Clinton. Some of the money going towards it was corporate money. And so the speakers in that case challenged this law, saying that this violates the free speech rights of those corporations to participate in a political debate. And the Supreme Court in a five to four decision says, yes, in this case, the corporations are right. This part of the law is unconstitutional. It goes against our broad commitment to broad political speech rights. That includes the rights of corporations to spend towards political communications independent of campaigns that can shape public discourse. Awesome, very good. Nice job there, Tom. Uh, next uh, co connection. So these three cases, Gideon v. Wainwright, Roe v. Wade and McDonald v. Chicago are looking at incorporation. And so students incorporation is after the 14th amendment, how do, do the Bill of Rights, how does the Bill of Rights get applied to the states and use it as like almost a shield and a protection of the individual. So we don't do it all at once. We don't rip off that band-aid. We do it piece by piece, selective incorporation. So Tom, these are three great examples of how they did it piece by piece. Do you wanna start with Gideon, which is an awesome story? Absolutely, so this is, you see up on the screen, Clarence Earl Gideon. He represents himself in court in Florida for a felony, uh, uh, he's uh, charged a felony, uh, like a burglary charge. Um, he loses, he's convicted, and he challenges the Florida law, which denied him free counsel in the case. And so at this point in time, Florida is one of the few states that wouldn't have given a defendant like Gideon, uh, a lawyer in that situation. He says, this violates the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. And what Gideon is about is about the court deciding, does that Sixth Amendment right it originally applied only to the national government. Are we going to apply it with full vigor to the states? And the court says, yes, Gideon, you are right. It says unanimously. And it's just an example, again, going piece by piece. In this case, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, the court saying, yes, those core protections apply to the states. And it's over time, Curry, as we know, it's how the Bill of Rights truly becomes a national document of freedom, applying not just to the national government, but fully to the states. Awesome. And the next case is around this idea of privacy, which isn't directly spelled out in the Bill of Rights, but this is about how do you apply this to the individual, through the states, to everybody, even when the, it's not, the word isn't in the document, the Bill of Rights. 
Yeah, this case is all about, are there rights that we have that aren't specifically written into the Constitution? And if so, what are they? And so this case involves a Texas woman looking to have an abortion. There's a Texas law in the books banning abortion except when a woman's life is in danger. And Jane Roe challenges this law and says that, you know, effectively, there's no, obviously no right to, right to reproductive rights in the Constitution written there specifically itself. But what she says is that under the 14th Amendment's due process clause, it's protected. And what she's looking to do is extend the right to privacy that was recognized a few years earlier in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut. And the Supreme Court here says in a seven to two decision, yes, Jane Roe is right. There is a right to, the right to privacy does apply to abortion. And so therefore with that, there are constitutional protections under the 14th amendment for reproductive rights. Of course, still a very uh, hot topic of debate among scholars, judges, et cetera, but that's, that's what Roe itself said. Next, McDonald v. Chicago. And Tom's also referencing other cases that are connected to it. So I'm gonna to try to make sure I drop them in the chat, but it's really good to think about answering these AP questions with connecting cases too. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, McDonald versus Chicago takes us to the question of the second amendment's right to keep and bear arms. And so this case is in 2010, two years earlier, the court decided a landmark second amendment case known as District of Columbia versus Heller. And what it said there is that the individual, each person has an individual right to keep and bear arms in their own home for purposes of protecting their family. So in that case, it struck down a Washington DC law banning handguns. But because Washington DC is a federal territory, the Bill of Rights directly applies there. McDonald versus Chicago was about, okay, that's true, that applies to the national government, but does the Second Amendment, does this protection apply to the states? Are we going to incorporate the Second Amendment rights against state abuses? In this case, a handgun ban in Chicago. And what the court says in a five to four decision is, yes, the Second Amendment is incorporated in part because this is a right that is deeply embedded in the American constitutional tradition. So we are going to extend that Bill of Rights protection to the states. And you know what it shows, that's 2010, this process is ongoing. And there's even been cases the last couple of years incorporating other rights. Awesome. So a um, big case. And so it stands on its own when we're talking about equality. We're talking about equal protection under the law and the 14th Amendment. And we look at the Brown versus Board of Education case and we think about, you know, look at this picture and we look at who. Who is the energy around these cases? And we remember it can be a six year old. It can be her parents. But it is also a string of Americans across the country that are fighting to utilize the 14th Amendment to gain equality in schools. So tell us about this case and kind of the work that went bubbling up to bring it to the Supreme Court. And you of course, have so it there. emerges from uh, you know activity by the civil rights movement more broadly, uh, also a litigation strategy by the lawyers of the NAACP, lawyers like Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall. And it all grows, it builds and builds to this moment with Brown versus Board of Education, which is a case that brings together a bunch of different cases from across the lower and upper South. And so this is a bunch of families, kids who, should, who are challenging segregation laws in a variety of states. So these are laws that are segregating public schools, said, saying that we're gonna have separate schools for white children and African-American children. And what the families and the students here are arguing is that that alone, that system of separation violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. That what could be more unequal than separating students in that way? The one barrier, the, one of the big barriers here for the court though, is that there was a, a, a case in the books, Plessy v. Ferguson from the late 1800s, which said that segregation is constitutional. And so what the court does here in opinion by Chief Justice Earl Warren for a unanimous court, it says the students, the families, you are right. The states here are wrong. That segregation in public schools it violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Separate, separate schools is inherently unequal. It brands students with a feeling of inferiority. Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong the day it was decided. Awesome. Uh, two, equal equality of representation. So we think, you know, so much about how we started our country and ensuring that we had fair voice, fair ideas, and fair representation. These two cases really look at the idea of how you make sure that your vote is equal to other citizens. And then Shaw versus Reno is gerrymandering, which I think is a really confusing topic and one that we're talking a lot about in many states right now, not just in 1993. 
Absolutely. So Baker versus Carr is part of the Warren court. So this is Chief Justice Earl Warren, again, the the reapportionment cases, which we just talked about Earl Warren. He wrote Brown versus Board of Education. He called these cases the most important cases in many ways of his time on the Supreme Court. And so this is a challenge brought by residents of Tennessee. They're challenging districts that were drawn by the state legislature of Tennessee. And what they say effectively is, Tennessee, you have not updated the state legislative districts in 60 years. And a lot has happened since then. People have moved from rural areas into the cities. And so because you haven't changed those districts, it means that a vote in the rural areas counts more than votes in the cities. And that we think that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Now the court had decided just a little over a decade earlier, we are not getting into these cases. These reapportionment cases are politically dangerous. And so we are not going to get into them. There is no constitutional principle to guide us here. And in Baker versus Carr, it's significant because the court says, no, 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 we're gonna reverse course. There is a, a, a case that you can bring under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause here, and we will hear it and we will decide it. And then two years later in Reynolds versus Sims, what the court does is it says, we need these, these decisions in drawing districts to be guided by one person, one vote. The principle must be as you're drawing districts that everyone's vote roughly counts equally. Awesome. And there are two good cases to reference in connection with each other for the exam. Um, and yes, Warren, I do have a salamander district for you right here. Thank you for referencing Elbridge Jerry. Um, and I, you know, when we look at this, is this fair? When you look at these shapes and these sizes, it makes you instinctually want to ask that question. Why did you do this? And is this fair the way you did it? And the answer could be yes, but what is this case about? Um, and how do we understand these shapes? Yeah, so this case is all about that issue of gerrymandering. And this is when you know people go into court and say that when the states have drawn districts, they've drawn it in a way that's unconstitutional. And so in these cases, these are racial, this is a case that is an important racial gerrymandering case. So the argument by the challengers here is that these districts, when the state drew them, the state took race too much into account and that violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. How do we know that race was taken into account here? The state legislature didn't see it, but what the challengers say is look at the districts. How is the state explaining that really weirdly shaped district there and what the, what the Supreme Court says in a, five, in a five to four decision is, yeah, the challengers are right. You know, states do have broad discretion to draw these districts, but if there is a district that is really irregularly shaped, maybe there's a great reason for the state to do that, but the state has to actually give that reason. And it has to be a really good one because the idea is we don't want race to be the dominant factor in uh, districting decisions. And the court said in that case, that would be a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Awesome. Uh, and we're cruising along now, Tom, because we have the last one, Marbury versus Madison, the role of judiciary. So we figured an ending with a solid classic case. Absolutely. So yeah, this is a case, it involves so many famous characters. You see Chief Justice Marshall there, he writes the opinion, but it involves John Adams, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, no one knows who John, you know, no, no one knows Marbury anymore. But everyone else is really famous. Um, and you know the facts are really complicated, but the basic idea is really, really important and easy to understand. And Chief Justice Marshall takes this case and he uses it to declare a law of Congress unconstitutional and more broadly speaking to, to help define one of the key roles the Supreme Court would play in the American constitutional system. And that's through the exercise of judicial review. That simply means that the Supreme Court has the power to rule on whether a law is constitutional or unconstitutional. And that this is a key, you know, the key thing that one gives the, the, the court itself uh, its power, two, the court is then using that power to try to keep the different branches of government um, within the restrictions that the people wrote into the constitution. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, as we know, this is an important, th- this sort of sets an important precedent that would then be uh, both a source of power and debate for the rest of American constitutional history. Awesome, Tom. Thank you so much for that quick kind of run through, getting all the students prepped with the connecting pieces. We have a few questions after class. So what I'm gonna do now, students, if you have to jump, we understand jump. If you have questions, pepper them in the chat or the Q&A and we're gonna just stop the recording and do that now. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, David Olson for rockstarring the chat and the Q&A and let's get to the the question part.